Hi, my name is Shailesh Singh and I make videos and podcasts on all things in cardiology. General cardiology, cardiovascular interventions, cardiovascular imaging, recent advances in cardiology, recent controversies in cardiology. So make sure to subscribe CardioEd YouTube channel and podcast for more of that. In this episode of CardioEd, we'll be talking about revascularization in special situations. These special situations include pregnancy, elderly patients, chronic kidney disease, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, revascularization before non-cardiac surgery and revascularization to reduce ventricular arrhythmia and revascularization in patients with cardiac allograft. Revascularization in pregnancy. In pregnant patients with ST segment elevation MI not caused by spontaneous coronary artery dissection, it is reasonable to perform primary PCI as the preferred revascularization strategy and this is class 2A recommendation. In pregnant patients with NST ACS or non ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome, an invasive strategy is reasonable if medical therapy is ineffective for the management of life threatening complications. Basically, there are four issues in pregnancy. Number one, decision making is always difficult in pregnancy because there is some risk to the unborn fetus, there is some risk to the mother. There is very limited data because pregnant females are usually excluded from clinical trials. What we know that aspirin is safe. Low-dose aspirin is safe during pregnancy. In small data, clopidogrel has been found to be safe. So, studies have recommended that if clopidogrel is needed, it should be used for shortest duration of time and should be given in close monitoring. Safety of other antiplatelet agents is not known. We have very limited data. The coronary revascularization in patients with pregnancy and ST segment elevation MI is typically by PCI. Coronary artery bypass grafting should be performed only if there is failure of medical therapy or PCI fails and mother's life is threatened. Studies have found that invasive approach for treatment of acute myocardial infarction is associated with significantly lower in-hospital mortality rate. For the management of non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome, usually conservative approach is preferred. If medical therapy is ineffective for management of these patients, either because of ongoing ischemia or hemodynamic compromise or electric instability, an invasive approach should be used. Revascularization in older patients. In older adults, treatment of coronary artery disease should be based on individual patient's preference, cognitive functions and life expectancy. And this is class 1 recommendation. So most clinical trials have defined older patients as age more than equal to 75 years. There are many challenges which are there in patients with old age and these include the presence of comorbid conditions, complex clinical presentations, there is increased bleeding risk in these patients. So we have to be very judicious with our antiplatelet agents. There is increased risk of stroke. Patients are usually on multiple drugs and there are possible multiple drug interactions Older patients benefit from revascularization to the same extent as the younger patient. An optimal strategy for revascularization should be chosen according to the patient's relative outcomes after PCI and CABG are comparable in older patients. And CABG is better at achieving the complete revascularization, whereas PCI is preferred for frail patients. Revascularization in patients with CKD or chronic kidney disease. In patients with chronic kidney disease undergoing contrast media injection for coronary angiography, measures should be taken to minimize the risk of contrast induced acute kidney injury. And this is class 1 recommendation. In patients with ST segment elevation MI and chronic kidney disease, coronary angiography and revascularization are recommended with adequate measures to reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. And this is class 1 recommendation. In high-risk patients with non-ST segment elevation, acute coronary syndrome and chronic kidney disease, it is reasonable to perform coronary angiography and revascularization with adequate measures to reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. And this is class 2A recommendation. In low-risk patients with non-ST segment elevation, acute coronary syndrome and chronic kidney disease, it is reasonable to weigh the risk of coronary angiography and revascularization against the potential benefits. And this is class 2 A recommendation. In asymptomatic patients with stable CAD and chronic kidney disease, 
routine angiography and revascularization are not recommended if there is no compelling indication and this is class 3 recommendation a large number of patients undergoing pci have underlying ckd it has been said that approximately 30 to 40% of all the patients undergoing pci have concomitant chronic kidney disease these patients have worse outcome after acute myocardial infarction or pci the risk of cardiovascular death has been found to be inversely proportional to egfr also patients with ckd who present with acute coronary syndrome are less likely to receive guideline directed medical therapy or invasive angiography as compared to the patients with normal renal functions patients who are undergoing coronary angiography can sometimes land up into contrast induced nephropathy and pre existing chronic kidney disease is the strongest independent risk factor for the development of acute kidney injury and higher stages of ckd is associated with higher risk how to prevent the contrast induced nephropathy so adequate hydration and minimization of contrast volume are the main strategies for prevention of contrast induced nephropathy high dose statins have been found to reduce contrast induced nephropathy this is because of their anti inflammatory effect this is because of their pleiotropic effect ethyrembolism is said to have an important role in the pathogenesis of acute kidney injury after percutaneous interventions so trans femoral approach may increase the risk of ethyrembolism leading to an increased risk of aki after pci therefore the use of radial axis in patients with underlying ckd should always be preferred to avoid acute kidney injury many trials have evaluated the role of n-acetylcysteine in prevention of contrast induced nephropathy but none of them have found the benefits of it so n-acetylcysteine should not be administered to prevent contrast induced nephropathy patients should not be given renal replacement therapy prophylactically for the prevention of contrast induced nephropathy if a patient with underlying ckd presents with st segment elevation mi prompt coronary angiography and revascularization should always be preferred because the benefits of revascularization in patients with st segment elevation mi outweighs the risk of adverse outcomes and the risk of aki in patients with ckd what about non st segment elevation acute coronary syndromes so patients with nst acs and ckd have worse prognosis as compared to nst acs patients without ckd for patients with non st segment elevation acute coronary syndrome with high risk and early invasive strategies always preferred revascularization in these patients leads to lower in hospital mortality rate as compared to medical management what about nst acs patients with low risk so there is very limited data about these subset of patients and risk benefit ratio should always be considered before taking a decision in these subset of patients what if the patient has got stable cad so ischemia ckd trial was the first randomized trial which evaluated the role of initial invasive strategy versus initial conservative management in patients with chronic stable ischemic heart disease with chronic kidney disease in this study patients with stable ischemic heart disease with at least moderate ckd and moderate ischemia were included and they were randomized to either initial invasive strategy or initial conservative management the trial found that an initial invasive strategy did not demonstrate a reduced risk of clinical outcomes or improved quality of life measures compared to initial conservative strategy what about revascularization in patients before non cardiac surgery in patients with non left main or non complex coronary artery disease who are undergoing non cardiac surgery routine coronary revascularization is not recommended solely to reduce perioperative cardiovascular events patients with significant cad who are undergoing high risk surgery have an increased risk of perioperative cardiovascular events so what are these high risk surgeries these high risk surgeries include solid organ transplantation or vascular surgery the routine prophylactic revascularization does not reduce the risk of death or cardiovascular events the authors have remarked that revascularization should not be done for the sole purpose of reducing perioperative complications 
in the patients and it should be considered in K patients with the symptoms or other indications for revascularization. Most of the guidelines have usually excluded the patients with high-risk coronary anatomy. Others have shown that there is no clinical benefit from routine revascularization in patients before the vascular surgery. The CARB study had randomized approximately 500 patients with more than equal to one significant coronary lesion to revascularization or medical management. And the trial found that there was no difference in 30-day or one-year mortality or death. An important point to remember is that this study had excluded the patients with left main CAD, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 20% and severe aortic stenosis. So the results of this trial may not apply to this patient population. Revascularization to reduce ventricular arrhythmias. In patients with ventricular fibrillation, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, that is VT, or cardiac arrest, revascularization of significant CAD is recommended to improve survival. And this is class 1 recommendation. In patients with CAD and suspected scar-related monomorphic VT, revascularization is not recommended for the sole purpose of preventing recurrent VT. And this is class 3 recommendation. These recommendations are in accordance with 2017 HRS, ACC, AHA guidelines for management of ventricular arrhythmia and prevention of sudden cardiac death. In these guidelines, it was recommended that for uh, secondary prevention of ventricular tachycardia in patients with ischemic heart disease, if the patient was a cardiac arrest survivor or had sustained spontaneous monomorphic ventricular tachycardia and had ischemia warranting revascularization, then patient should be revascularized and then reassess for risk of sudden cardiac death. This was class 1 recommendation as per the 2017 ACC, AHA and HRS guidelines and the current document also recommends the same. Monomorphic VT in non-acute setting is attributable to scar-related re-entry or increased automaticity rather than ischemia. In large cohort studies, elective revascularization has not been found to reduce ventricular arrhythmia in stable patients. Scar-related re-entry or increased automaticity cannot be treated by revascularization and revascularization in these subset of patients is not recommended by the 2021 ACC, AHA and SCI coronary revascularization guidelines. Revascularization in patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So in patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection who have hemodynamic instability or an ongoing ischemia despite conservative therapy, Revascularization may be considered if feasible, and this is class 2B recommendation. Routine revascularization for spontaneous coronary artery dissection should not be performed, and this is class 3 recommendation. Firstly, what is a spontaneous coronary artery dissection? So, spontaneous coronary artery dissection is interruption of coronary intimal layer followed by intramural hematoma. This intramural hematoma can progress and cause vessel compression and may present as acute coronary syndrome. Most of these spontaneous dissections usually heal by themselves. Some of these patients may have symptomatic ischemia. The management of this condition is challenging. Most of the patients are managed conservatively. In patients who have got uh, ongoing ischemia or vessel occlusion or hemodynamic instability, revascularization may be necessary. It is important to remember that the guidelines that we are using in PCI may propagate the dissection. Stents, balloons and the hardware that we are using in the PCI can lead to propagation of dissection and worsening of intramural hematoma. There are challenges which are associated with coronary artery bypass grafting surgery also. Many patients land up with acute graft closure if CABG is performed onto a dissected vessel. Trials have found that the failure rate for PCI for spontaneous coronary artery dissection is very high. That is approximately 35 to 53%. And 9 to 13% of the patients might land up requiring urgent CABG. It has been shown that if conservative management in spontaneous coronary artery dissection is compared with active revascularization, there was no difference in short-term or long-term mortality rate, myocardial infarction, heart failure or spontaneous coronary artery dissection recurrence. Revascularization in patients with cardiac allograft. 
in patients with cardiac allograft vasculopathy and severe proximal discrete coronary lesions revascularization with pci is reasonable and this is class 2a recommendation cardiac allograft vasculopathy is the most important cause of death after the first year after heart transplantation cardiac allograft vasculopathy is often diffuse and characterized by concentric and rapidly progressive intimal hyperplasia definitive therapy for cardiac allograft vasculopathy is retransplantation there is always a scarcity of donor organs so revascularization with pci is an important palliative measure in patients with focal disease this was a discussion on a revascularization in special populations and situations we were talking about 2021 acc aha and sei guidelines on coronary revascularization you are listening to cardioid and we'll meet again in the next episode